We're here tonight for our November um, 29th, 2018 um, curriculum committee meeting. And uh, the, the review of the um, description of the last meeting is available and the link to the videos that provide the minutes to the previous uh, curriculum committee are fully available. And so our first agenda item this evening um, is our AVID program. So if I could get Dr. Wistead and um, um, I'm thinking of, right, okay. So Dr. Wildridge is not available tonight, so Mike Barbieri is here. Barbarisi, I'm sorry, is here um, with me to talk about the AVID program. So he's really our specialist um, in this area. He's a supervisor in college and career readiness, and we're going to share a little bit about the AVID program and then our expansion to elementary school, which we're starting this year. Hi, I just want to say thank you all uh, first for having me and granting us uh, this audience, giving uh, me an opportunity to talk about something I'm extremely passionate about, and that is the AVID college system in Baltimore County Public Schools. Since you all are new to Mr. Barbarisi, I will tell you his name is Mike Avid Barbarisi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. It's the clicker's not. Sorry. Oh. All right. <laughs> So um, AVID is an acronym. It stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination. Um, and our mission is to close the achievement gap by preparing all students for college readiness and success in a global society. We talk in general broad terms about what AVID is. It's a school-wide uh, college readiness system, K through 12, and uh, also in post-secondary, mostly in uh, community colleges. Uh, it is a structured approach to a rigorous curriculum uh, where we think about curriculum very often as content. AVID's curriculum really is strategies based around the five college readiness skills of writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. And in addition to that curriculum that's provided to teachers uh, at AVID schools. Uh, it's also, we also get professional development um, along with our partnership um, with AVID. So throughout the year, we offer two hour uh, PDs for teachers. Um, we started that back in 16, 17, where over 70 teachers got certified by doing 12 hours in one school year. Last year, we doubled that to 140 teachers. And this year, we're on track to get 280 teachers uh, AVID trained by attending 12 hours over the course of one school year. Mm -hmm. We could look at two sides of uh, the AVID system here. The first is pre-K through five. Um, it is a school-wide system in which writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading strategies, which we call WICOR strategies, are used in all academic classes. AVID methodologies are there to support uh, student-centered and engaging teaching and learning structures. And we also look for college-going culture in hallways, common areas, and in all classrooms. At the secondary level, we also implement AVID as a school-wide college readiness system, but there is also an AVID elective class for grades 6 through 12. Uh, we recruit kids as early as 6th grade and ask them to commit to having that elective on their schedule all the way through their matriculation uh, into college after graduation. So it's a full-year class, uh, the same way any of the regular content area classes would be, but that curriculum is designed to allow students to explore their college and career interests, as well as building up those college-ready uh, skills through WIC or strategies. 40% of the time in the AVID elective class is spent in tutorology sessions, which is where small groups of students bring a point of confusion um, that they're struggling with in their classes. They present that point of confusion to their peers. And with the aid of a college age or uh, another volunteer tutor in the room, they work through their problem as their uh, fellow peers in the class use a Socratic dialogue to help them get past their point of confusion. So what do we do? Uh, we develop readers and writers. We develop uh, that deep content knowledge above just kind of surface understandings by driving kids uh, toward their own uh, quest for inquiry in their core classes. We teach strategies for reading, writing, thinking, and speaking, and develop habits, skills, and behaviors to use knowledge, those knowledge, that knowledge, and those abilities. 
There are four domains that we talk about when we look at the AVID uh, system in any school. The first is instruction, and those are where we're using the AVID curriculum to build uh, those WICOR skills through WICOR strategies. Second is systems. So when we talk about systems, um, we're we look annually at uh, data that is collected um, through the MyAvid portal, and we hold our schools accountable for closing achievement gaps and accelerating uh, not only the achievement of students in the AVID elective class, but in all classes school-wide. We also know that uh, leadership is a big part of our AVID college readiness system, so each school has an AVID site coordinator that coordinates an AVID site team. On that AVID site team, there's at least one administrator, counselor, and then we look for having one uh, teacher in each content area um, also to support that school-wide implementation. And lastly, um, we want AVID to influence the culture and the climate of the school. So in our domain of culture, we look for that college-going culture um, in the halls, but also just developing a rigorous, relevant curriculum that gets kids engaged and excited about learning. Brief summary of elementary resource, research. So students who participate in AVID elementary schools develop greater understanding of their instructional outcomes and objectives, stronger social cognition skills. They learn to think, they learn to learn, and they develop stronger metacognition skills than students who did not participate in AVID. Um, in short, that means that students in an AVID elementary school can tell you what they are doing and why they are doing that, and they become reflective learners through that process. In the middle school, uh, the research shows that students who participate in AVID uh, enroll in Algebra 1 at a greater rate than their non-AVID peers, score higher on the Ready Step uh, assessment, earn higher GPAs in their fourth quarter of uh, their eighth grade year, and uh, were suspended fewer days. And then in, across all of our uh, secondary data, it shows that our students uh, attend school more regularly than non-AVID students. The high school research uh, shows us that more of our AVID students enroll in AP courses than their non-AVID peers. They complete uh, college entry requirements at a, at a higher rate, and we're above 99% in college entry requirements and graduation. They matriculate to their second year of college at a higher rate than their non-AVID uh, peers, and that's because we're not just trying to get them into college, but give them those skills that are gonna make them successful uh, throughout college. And they graduate with their four-year degree within eight years uh, at a higher rate than their non-AVID peers. To give you a little uh, snapshot of what that looks like in Baltimore County now, 91% uh, of our students are going to apply, will apply to a four-year college. 86% of those students are accepted uh, into four-year colleges, and 93% of those students will go to college right after high school. 74% of those kids will go to a four-year college right after high school. So you can see these are our current AVID high schools. We're in every high school uh, right now except for Eastern Tech and Carver. Uh, you'll notice that Newtown High School and Pikesville High School are highlighted there. Newtown High School is currently the only Nav AVID National Demonstration School in the state of Maryland. And what that means is they're operating with the highest levels of fidelity and seeing real impressive impacts on the students in the AVID elective class. Last year, AVID uh, created a new uh, certification ranking called School-Wide Site of Distinction, where we're not just looking at the kids in the AVID elective class, but we want to see the impact of closing achievement gaps and improving achievement school-wide. So last year, uh, Newtown High School and Pikesville High School became the first AVID School-Wide Site of distinction in the state of Maryland. Pikesville is on track to become a demonstration school this year. We have a validation at the end of the school year, and in just a few weeks, we're getting revalidated uh, by AVID at Newtown High School. Um, that's a three-year process of accountability where they come in and coach us and then um, give us uh, that, those certifications. We have one school-wide site of distinction at the middle school level, and that is Dundalk Middle School. Um, and right now, we're in all but nine of our middle schools in Baltimore County. Uh, when we look at uh, students enrolled in the AVID elective class at the secondary level, we have over 4,800 students enrolled in the AVID elective class. And if we look at schools that um, implement AVID as a school-wide system, we impact over 47,000 students uh, in those schools. Right now, we piloted our first elementary uh, school and so at Hollibird STEM we have AVID school-wide um, throughout the school and we are implementing with fidelity in grades four and five. They also have the AVID elective class in their grades six, seven, and eight and we just completed an onboarding uh, or selection process for onboarding and we have ten schools that are listed there that will become 
our projected growth is to add those 10 uh, elementary schools next year, and we're currently in the process of doing that same selection and recruitment um, with four middle schools, so up to four middle schools will come on next year. Two years after that, we're looking at adding another 10 AVID elementary schools and the remaining five uh, middle school sites, and then uh, 20, in 2023-24, we intend on adding another 10 AVID elementary school sites. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about AVID. <laughs> Fellow committee members, anyone, any questions uh, from your okay. station? I don't have a question. Oh, always far, but okay, hold on. I don't have a question, but I'm AVID. Um, I was an AVID ninth and 10th grade. So yeah, go AVID. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. I, um, I guess I wanted to ask a question about the motivation for expanding uh, into elementary schools, but um, it uh, really, uh, touches my heart, I guess, that we are expanding and, and have a greater presence at middle school and high school now, I mean, middle school and elementary school, because as uh, some of the outcomes from the Kerwin Commission studies and, and are starting to come out and uh, looking at the outcomes from the high school graduation task force, having the 10th grade now as a trigger point in terms of directing kids into either career or college path, um, became, be, be, became a concern to me because um, a lot of um, uh, parts of our uh, growing uh, student demographic have not traditionally gone on to college or whatever, and sometimes it's because their family situation or background mm -hmm. just doesn't lead them there. So it's not necessarily their academic ability, it's their awareness. Uh, and. Um, I guess some of the, the direction that the Kerwin Commission is going to take us can sometimes exacerbate that. You know, if, if kids aren't aware of what is required for college or aren't thinking of it, um, I was concerned that using the 10th grade as opposed to a later point could actually keep more kids from following that pathway. But expanding it into elementary school and the middle school, just making sure our kids understand what's required and getting them to make these decisions at an earlier point is going to help combat what my fear was, I guess. But I wanted to ask you, that's a long way of asking a question, what was the motivation for expanding from your perspective into the lower grades? Sure. Um, so we know that AVID is good for kids, but in Baltimore County, we've always been a uh, secondary um, school program. Um, a lot of our professional development over the years has been opened up to not only secondary, but also elementary stat teachers and others. And to be quite honest, elementary was beating down our door. <laughs> there was demand um, from the teacher level up through the administrator level at many schools. Um, those 10 that we onboarded were amongst many that we had to consider when we put out there um, for uh, people to apply to be a part of that AVID program. Additionally, when AVID came to Baltimore County in 2002, there was no such thing as AVID Elementary. So it has been developed over the past half of a decade. And so um, nationally, that rollout is coming at about the same pace a as it is in Baltimore County. So the interest and awareness in the impacts of AVID at the secondary level in Baltimore County have influenced our elementary teachers and administrators to actually request those uh, that professional development curriculum and support that comes with being an AVID school. Right, that, and that is very nice to hear because we all agree that college is not a pathway for everybody, but it shouldn't be a choice because you just aren't aware or you're not prepared. Uh, it should be because you, you've weighed your options and you have some options. So I think AVID does give uh, our students more options and more awareness to make uh, um, more appropriate choices for their academic journey. I guess. Yeah, in the 2017 um, class um, where we graduated over 500 AVID seniors, a majority, two thirds of those students will be the first in their, um, in their family to go to college. Mm -hmm. It is definitely one of the criteria we look at as we're recruiting uh, students into that program. And for those about 500 students that graduated this past year, they earned a cumulative um, offers of $40 million in scholarships and grants. That is impressive. And um, I I think I uh, did visit Newtown when they originally became the, I guess, the only school in Maryland, I think at the time, that was a, a site, I don't know. Uh, the demonstration demonstra school. Yeah, yeah, right. So it was a very impressive thing. So you're saying Pikesville is on that same uh, track. 
Yes, and both those schools have become our teaching and learning centers where we bring people from other AVID schools to really see the highest levels of implementation, which is nice. When I started with AVID over a decade ago, we were kind of learning it as we went, and it's really fortunate to have it baked into the culture of Baltimore County to have such highly performing, um, or schools that are performing and implementing with such high levels of fidelity that now we're seeing that impact um, our other schools as they look to attain those same levels. And, and the AVID students, like Halima, all seem to be very proud of being AVID <laughs> students. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, good spirit and energy around the program. So uh, I compliment all of you for it. Emory, did you have a, a yes. yeah? I think in the presentation you mentioned all of the high schools except one. Two. Two. Um, yeah, so Eastern Tech and Carver are not uh, currently AVID schools. Okay. Uh, I know you've laid out within the next two years that the um, – remaining middle schools are going to become AVID. So is Carver and Eastern going to become AVID schools or? So our doors are always open to those schools. The challenge in our magnet schools has been um, the scheduling and that as um, a um, added barrier to um, them onboarding uh, into AVID. Our doors are always open. I think we start that conversation um, with those schools and make sure that they're aware of that um, over time. But there is in those uh, two magnets a little bit more of a challenge in implementing the AVID elective. So with the 30 elementary schools that you kind of laid out, or you didn't list them, but you said within the next three years there's going to be 30 elementary schools, those are more the schools that are reaching out saying we want to do this as opposed to you're selecting 30 schools starting there and then have a plan for the remaining schools. Yeah, an important part um, is the application process. So oh, part of that process is uh, people in the school and the leaders being on board with training all of the teachers in it and ensuring the fidelity of the implementation of all the strategies. So it would always be them applying. It wouldn't be selecting or kind of, um, yeah, mandating that a, a particular school do it. Okay, thank you. Um, I, another question that came to mind, you mentioned that Newtown was the only one in Maryland. How, how about the other educational jurisdictions around Maryland, how much have they embraced AVID uh, compared to Baltimore County? So um, Anne Arundel Public Schools um, is kind of the closest in terms of their implementation with us. They do have the only national demonstration middle school. Okay. Um, we, we have a, a few schools in Baltimore City uh, that implement AVID, but it's not a system-wide um, initiative as it is here in Baltimore County. And they, it also exists in Prince George's and Montgomery County schools, but in a smaller scale than here in Baltimore. County. Okay. Well, I think we should have a lot of pride in what we've been doing uh, in Baltimore County. It's a good, good program from what we've, you've shared with us and what we've seen. So we have people actually from around the country who come out to see uh, Newtown High School on a regular basis. I think last year we had um, four months in a row where they were getting at least monthly visits from people who were outside of our school district that wanted to learn more about the implementation of AVID. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Um, while I know um, some of our committee members will not be with us forward, um, this will be an item that you may see coming forward in the budget cycle. So just as a, a highlight to that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Our next um, agenda item here is our response to the stat evaluation. If you recall in, I think it was October, uh, mm -hmm. the Johns Hopkins, um, uh, Dr. Morris um, had come and did our end of year evaluation. And so uh, they left us with a set of recommendations mm -hmm. as they always do. And we're here this evening to share with you this our action plan related to those recommendations. And so okay. I have uh, Mr. Imbriali and Ms. Shea here to share with you our, our actions moving forward based on those recommendations. All right. Good evening. Hi, good evening, good evening everyone. Hi. Uh, so um, I'm just gonna start uh, framing it around the logic model. Um, Johns Hopkins has shared this logic model each of the times that uh, they've presented to the board since um, we started the third party evaluation. And it's um, really really about looking at um, each part of the process as it builds towards um, student achievement. And it really starts with the professional development, which we'll talk about uh, in this presentation. Uh, and then what's happening in our classrooms around uh, the environment, teacher practice, and then um, 
what kind of digital content and tools do we have, both on the academic end and those kind of tools that we have that can reach all of our students and can meet multiple academic areas. Uh, and so uh, with that, um, we'll talk a little bit about the overall recommendations that Johns Hopkins brought forward. So in the um, presentation, they went over a lot of the feedback that they'd received from a variety of stakeholders and in, through some of their observations. And at the end of the report, they essentially summarized it with four main recommendations. And so um, tonight, as part of our presentation, these four recommendations, um, the first of which is this um, idea about stat teachers and the ratio in particular of stat teachers. Um, also this um, idea of teacher planning time. Um, targeted professional learning around um, the STAT initiative, and then the fourth recommendation was um, around middle school device and home use in particular. Um, so what we're going to do now is go through each one of those recommendations and share what our action plan of response is based on those recommendations. So when it comes to STAT teachers, so uh, just so everyone is clear, all of our schools have a full-time STAT teacher uh, we like to refer to them as instructional coaches that are in each of our school buildings. And in each of the buildings, it naturally looks a little different based on the unique needs of each of those individual schools. One of the things that we've done over the course of the years that the position has existed is there is now a stat teacher pool. So through human resources, there is a formalized process that helps establish baseline qualifications. And then our principals can go through the process of looking at that candidate, candidate pool and then determining from that pool through an interview process who is the best fit or match for their unique school building, whether that's an elementary school, middle school, or a high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, the school determines what talent is necessary in their individual building to meet the needs of the school. Um, stat teachers receive, uh, and we started to do this about a year and a half ago, stat teachers now receive differentiated professional learning based on um, some factors. So one of those is their individual uh, needs that they see in their building. And this is done monthly. So we have monthly stat conference meetings that are held. During those monthly stat conference professional development, there's information that's provided to all the stat teachers, baseline information that everyone needs to know. And then our stat teachers have the opportunity to differentiate based on the needs. Sometimes that's secondary versus elementary in terms of the needs that are provided. And in other cases, it might be unique to things that they need for their particular building, as an example. Um, we've also worked to develop additional opportunities for our department chairs at the secondary level and for our assistant principals as well. So um, it depends on the on the building, uh, uh, Dr. Adams uh, used a great metaphor when he talked about it would be nice to have a diagram. So when you look at the picture at an elementary school, there's a principal and there's an assistant principal. Sometimes there's two. And then there's the stat teacher who helps work with all the teachers in that building. At our secondary schools, if you think of one of our uh, high schools, uh, at our high schools you have the principal, multiple assistant principals who are there to help support and provide guidance. And then you have a level of department chairs who are there as well, along with that stat teacher. So although there is only one stat teacher in every school, it depends on the school and the level about how professional development and information through our academic offices is distributed out to those individuals in the building. So the next recommendation that came out um, loud and clear in teacher interviews and in um, feedback was this notion of increasing teacher planning time. Um, and so our first response is, we agree. We recognize that teacher planning and co-planning is a critical um, part of them being able to be responsive and, and plan for the needs of their students. Um, but as this committee and, and the full board knows, we do have challenges around our school calendar. You most recently had um, a lot of discussion around that. And so sometimes what we realize is the time we used to have built in for that type of professional learning has been waning. Um, and so what we have to do is be more creative with how we support this idea of teacher planning um, and what are the structures and supports we can put in place so that what we know is really important work still can happen so we can support the needs of our teachers making this transition but to do it within the limits that we have and so one of those is um, specifically maximizing co-planning opportunities so Mr. Imbriali mentioned this idea of creating teams of support
support. So it isn't just a stat teacher, but it may be a stat teacher and a department chair working in collaboration to support um, a department of teachers or a group of new teachers. Um, we also have tapped into many of our administrators um, are very creative around scheduling. And so they're able to use their master schedule to provide opportunities for collaborative planning within the school day, either through the use of their um, elective or special area programming um, and some of those other pieces. So trying to help support um, learning from the experts in the building, some of our principals who have gotten really good at that type of creative scheduling and then sharing that with other schools so that we can use the time we do have more efficiently. But then also, this idea of um, coaching support. So we do have a team of resource teachers in academic contents to support this idea of um, team planning um, so that we can model the structures both at planning for long range, so at the unit level, but then also getting into that daily lesson planning. And, and I'll talk a little bit more on another recommendation slide about how we've shifted that model um, this year. And then the last one up there, in the last several years, we have hosted in the summertime um, responsive instruction workshops. And so at these workshops, every, um, I believe, middle and high school in the last two summers, um, organization development organized workshops where teams of teachers could come together with academic content support um, and blended learning support to do some long range planning. And this was a time where I think um, just the notion of summer, teachers felt a little bit more um, freedom to explore because sometimes in the day to day planning with students, you don't necessarily um, have that opportunity to really explore all the different tools out there. So those workshops were really highly evaluated from teachers. So our plan is to figure out a way to continue that um, so that we have an opportunity to differentiate that kind of support um, for teachers. And so um, part of that too is this idea of using technology um, to support planning and planning with technology. And what I mean by that is when we talk about some of the um, shifts that our STAT initiative really embodies about um, teaching and learning in the 21st century, what we have to understand is that has also warranted shifts in the way teachers plan. When I first started planning, I had sticky notes and a pencil and my teaching guide. And that was what I planned with. And that has changed. And so what we've had to do is to support our teachers in understanding the thinking and the expertise that teachers bring hasn't changed but we have to support them in, um, in the same way that we're shifting teaching and learning in the classroom. How can we support teachers in how they can use those tools to plan in an efficient way as well? So we've actually uh, dedicated the next two slides to the conversation around professional development. One of the things that if you go back and look at all of the reports that have come from uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Research and Reform and Education, uh, professional development is always something that comes up as um, an area to continue to refine, continue to improve on. And uh, we don't disagree. Uh, uh, part, of, part of our message is that if professional development didn't continuously show up, uh, then it wouldn't show that we need to continually grow um, our, our offerings and what we're providing to teachers. So when we talk about uh, professional development, some of the things that we've done uh, recently to increase our offerings if we, is we've expanded our offerings that we provide through Digital Learning University. So this is an opportunity for our teachers to uh, choose in and opt to take courses for CPD credit. Those courses um, can lead to continued certification. Um, it may be they move to a different salary lane depending on how many uh, continuing professional development credits they earn. We offer them on a multitude of different uh, topics and areas, but we have targeted courses in our digital learning university around topics related to mindset, related to blended learning, facilitating student, uh, student research, and also courses that are specifically targeted to um, our new learning management system, Schoology, so teachers can become as comfortable as possible in that particular environment. We also are continuing to expand job embedded professional development during the school day. So you know, a great example of this is we work with our stat teachers to understand how they can offer things that are optional like coffee hour, um, lunch, lunchtime professional learnings where teachers can opt in to, to come down and learn something new where they can also do those kinds of things immediately after school or immediately before school. They also go in and do co-teaching peer work with teachers and then co-planning as well as Megan talked about in terms of working with our teachers one-on-one -on -one in an atmosphere that helps them feel more comfortable about something they might be implementing in the classroom.
My favorite of those is called DIP Day, and it stands for Drop-In Professional Learning, but they also serve DIP. And the teachers can come <laughs> in. It's kind of like an open house, and I think that really speaks to this idea of differentiated professional development. So teachers can come as they have time to talk about what they need, and it might be this one lesson or this one tool, but rather than it being planned for them, teachers really get to drive what that content looks like, and there's DIP. So sorry, <laughs> I'm going to chime in no, that di example. DIP Day is a great example, <laughs> because the other thing that DIP Day does is you can then, once you've, once you've come in, you can offer ideas for other other opportunities, and so it really it really is um, it, it builds its own path in terms of what individual and group individual teachers and groups of teachers need in terms of professional learning opportunities. And then the last thing on this slide is really our Blended Learning Institute, um, which we uh, expanded this past summer immediately after the school year ended for students. Uh, we had um, a, a pretty intensive week of professional learning across the system. Um, that included a number of different opportunities, and uh, one of them for all of our levels, elementary, middle, and high, included a blended learning institute where we, we really took the opportunity to delve deep into the conversation around how does blended learning look in practice and how does it intersect with academics, um, and, and how does that connect to school progress plans. And so really our administrators and teachers in each individual building were able to get the professional development that they needed and then come together as a school and have conversations about what does that look like in the culture of my particular building and how do we implement that um, in an effective way. And um, that leads right into the next slide because the Blended Learning Institute this past year really was the first time that we made a deep, deep connection with academics. Right, and so part of the recommendation in the report from Johns Hopkins also talks um, about the need for um, targeted professional development. I'm just going to keep talking while he does that. Um, specific to teachers want to know not just about the tool or about the device, but how does that actually help me be a better math teacher or a better science teacher? And so um, as Mr. Ambriali was saying, we made a very concerted effort this summer to shift the Blended Learning Institute so that it really was about academics and schools could see that intersection. So this is a way to understand how this tool expands opportunities for teaching and learning and deepening your content knowledge. It's not something separate. And um, that was really well received. And so we're continuing to refine that idea of how do we um, blend the two together, which also speaks to our, um, what I mentioned before about trying to maximize the time we have. Um, but what was really um, important is that it was um, understanding. So we may have a variety of digital tools, say, for example, that we've um, been able to procure and that are part of the device. But how does that tool help support inquiry in a social studies classroom? How do teachers plan for and give feedback to students using the tools more efficiently? Another piece that I mentioned before is this idea of resource teacher support. So part of the um, recommendation in the report from STAT was, um, was also talking about this idea of teachers are at different places. And so what we have to recognize is that not everybody adapts to change in the same way, and not everybody has the same level of comfort. Um, and in the same way, our schools are very different. We have um, different populations of students and teachers that we need to serve. And so what we did this year with the resource teacher model um, to shift is that teachers really talked to us about they wanted us to show it, show us how to do this with my students. Come into my classroom and show me in my environment what would this look like. Um, and that was really important because what we know is that no two classrooms look alike. And so um, the resource teacher model this year, um, we have what we're calling a residency model, where instead of being sort of whack-a-mole where the resource teacher go everywhere. Um, we work together with the school support team to identify um, priority schools and the resource teachers are there um, similar to like a business consultant model and when they are there they stay there for a number of weeks and that way they're able to really dig in and go um, deeply into modeling and co-teaching um, with teachers and getting to know their students so that the suggestions they make um, for support are very tailored to the community that they're serving. And, and can I just mention we're, we're doing the same model it's not just our academic resource teachers, but we're using that exact same model with the resource teachers that we have in, in blended learning as well. So they're able to go out and um, deep dive, spend an extended period of time at a particular school. Um, and then the last piece is um, on this particular um, idea, again, speaks to this idea of trying to work smarter, um, which was, as you know, we made a big lift this year where we shifted to a new learning management system. 
trilogy, and we knew that that was going to be um, a big lift in terms of professional learning for teachers. And so what we made a very specific decision around was that all of our central professional learning would be delivered through Schoology. So just by participating in a meeting, you're actually learning the learning management system along the way. And so rather than teachers coming and using a different tool like Padlet or a Google Doc for a discussion, we teach them, here's how you do a discussion in Schoology. So they participate as adult learners, but at the same time, they're learning a tool that then they can use with their students. Um, I will tell you, when we first sort of made that decision with central office folks, they were like, no, we can't do that. That's too much, too fast. But what they realized is the system itself is so intuitive, but also the benefit that they were getting from helping teachers um, to learn the um, learning management system and then to be able to turnkey that to support the kind of um, teaching that they're doing in their classrooms. And so then um, the last recommendation really spoke to this idea around um, that we should take a closer look about the decision about when we start letting devices go home. So um, part of the report talked about some feedback they heard from teachers and administrators in middle school. Um, where this was presenting a little bit of a challenge, where sometimes the devices went home and didn't come back, or they came back and they weren't charged, and the impact that that was having on the classroom. And so um, what we realized is with any new um, initiative, it, we're all, you know, we always go back to the idea of we're teachers first. And so part of our reflection has been, how much have we done to front load and teach our students the how that goes with caring for a new tool and taking on that responsibility of taking things back and forth, um, and how that would have an impact on school if that tool becomes such an integral part of the way that we teach and learn. And so what we thought would be important is to bring together a stakeholder work group of a variety of stakeholders so that we can really develop best practices for, first of all, understanding what are the pain points. So let's really narrow this down. Um, is it something that we can solve through plans and structures to support charging devices? Is it something that we need to help teach kids routines for how to take them home? Um, <clears throat> but we don't want to overcorrect and not allow students to have the access that this device affords them. But we do want to recognize that that is a pain point that our um, teachers and schools are identifying. And so our next step is really to dig more deeply into that and really talk with our stakeholders and listen to what exactly is the problem and then what are some options that we can create. Um, for example, one of the things that we've talked about, and certainly this is just an idea at this point because we would really want this stakeholder group to help us make some decisions moving forward is um, should it be a gradual release that maybe the devices don't go home the first week they get them, but they sort of first learn how to use them in school and then it's maybe at the second marking period that we begin to use them for home use, that type of thing. Um, what we know is that our kids can learn the responsibility and the example that we talk about, um, my son is in sixth grade and he plays the trumpet. And I can tell you that when middle school started, I thought, oh, this is going to get left on the bus. And he was stressed about having to go back to the instrument storage to make sure he brought it home. Um, he figured it out because he knows he needs to be able to bring it back and forth so that he can practice and increase his proficiency as a trumpet player. So we want to make sure that we tap into that. We know that our students can learn how to be responsible for taking things back and forth. But we also want to be sensitive to this is feedback our teachers are giving us, that this is a problem right now. This is a pain point in some instances based on the feedback from the report. So how can we really dig deeply into listening to what it is they're experiencing and create structures and support to address that? I sort of just kept talking. Did you have anything else? It's, it's just fine. You did wonderful, <laughs> Megan. <sorry>. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the other thing that the work group would, would have to factor in here as well is, is just the natural realities of is, is there actually a cost either for having them continue to go home or having them stay at school. And that, that has to be a factor into the equation. Um, and so with that, uh, we'll open it up to questions that you might have. Just, I guess, really quickly on, the, on that last item with the stakeholder work group, I mean, do you have a time frame for where you're expecting uh, recommendations from them? We haven't even formed the group yet. So that would be our first step, would be to identify the members of the group. And then we would certainly, part of the first step would be to establish a timeline. Certainly we would want any recommendations to be in a really good place before the end of this year so that whatever needed to be communicated to schools and families was really solid before um, that transition. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, I, I think my question um, centers around the professional development strategies and um, 
it seemed like in some of the earlier reports, Hopkins was talking about a confusing role for STAT teachers, mm -hmm. and now I guess it's the content that they're going to um, communicate. And I guess my question is all that, who in the staff at BCPS is going to own and monitor the implementation of this? Because I think the principles that you're communicating seem sound, but I'm just not sure how we know, we know that we're actually moving forward there because that thing about the stat teachers not, you know, the early kind of comment just seemed to linger for a very long time mm -hmm. and it wasn't clear, like, who's watching this? Mm -hmm. yeah. So with the professional development, my question is around the same thing. I mean, sure. who, who owns that? Yeah, so um, let me kind of take it in two you? parts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, it's two parts to that, right? So um, when... One, part of what we've done to help alleviate, when we think about schools where stat teachers were being um, utilized for more than their, their focus on professional development for their colleagues, when we looked very closely at that, what we find is there are settings where, for example, some of our elementary schools that did not have an assistant principal. Right. As right. you are well aware, part of what we did as an organization moving into this year is we were able to allocate a .5 assistant mm -hmm. principal to those schools. That has helped alleviate where we find, you know, a principal who doesn't have sufficient support looks to who is available to, to, to help. And that's when we looked really closely at that. That's where we found that, uh, that there was a need. And so we took measures to help provide some supports for that. Um, and I believe... Um, in the moving forward, I anticipate that um, trying to round those out to full-time assistant principals, you know, we still, we, we haven't really even entered that budget process, but, uh, but so that's part of what has alleviated that. And when we talk about who's responsible for that, what work the stat teacher does in a building, just like any teacher at a school level, the principal is ultimately the, the supervisor of the work and how the um, stat teacher is supported in doing that work. Um, and that comes together in a lot of different ways. I know we shared earlier stat teachers in providing professional development for their colleagues um, actually typically have a wide menu of the way in which they provide that support. Everything from collaboratively planning with a, a teacher or a group of teachers, going in and co-teaching to do models, modeling how um, different instructional um, methods and resources can be utilized in the classroom directly, um, as well as offering the example of, uh, like they may say, this is dip day, so all day they're in the professional development room, and as teachers hit their planning period, then have the option to drop in and uh, work on some professional development that is being highlighted at that particular day or is pre-organized um, or scheduled as well as um, <coughs> after school um, professional development opportunities. So their work is uh, very dynamic and flexible and uh, much of that is, um, I shouldn't say much of it, all of their work ultimately is um, overseen by the principal. And, and so I, did I, go ahead. Can I also offer, there's also accountability built around this too. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, at, at the, at the outer outer ring, every school has a school progress plan. Okay. Um, and then uh, most of our schools have some sort of instructional plan. Mm -hmm. The stat teacher, there is a there is an there is a there's a professional development plan that every stat teacher writes in collaboration with their okay. administrative team I in the school. I oh, I see. So okay. so Forgive that plan is really their action plan for the school year. Not that it can't be changed or adjusted based on needs, okay. but they work um, with other mentor stat teachers, uh, with uh, with a cohort of stat teachers, with their administration to put in on paper what they're going to do okay. for that school year, um, okay. and then it's about implementing that and. Um, it is about the administration and the school at the first level holding that stat teacher accountable. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but there's lots of layers to that. You know, as we've had this program now for a number of years, there's a natural turnover and growth in, in who's in the position. People have been uh, promoted to assistant principal positions, moved on to different things. And so they're in the stat teacher role now. There's also mentors among stat teachers. Okay. So you have a lot of support layers built in. The, the right. other thing I was going to add is that. Um, 
I think we have learned, because to your point, we were saying for a number of years that we wanted the position to be about instruction. Mm -hmm. But then as we reflected, um, Mr. Mirali mentioned that stat teachers come every month for a stat conference. Well, for the first year or two, the content of what we were delivering wasn't matching what we said we wanted that to focus on because we were worried about some of the um, just roll out and things like that. More recently, when you come to the monthly stack conference, it's a teaching and learning conference. You will see content that is about academics, that is about um, strategies for formative assessment, that is about, so I think we have owned that if we say this is what we want this job to be about, to your point, and we want them to be held accountable for doing that kind of work, then we have to make sure that we align with the type of professional development and resources we're providing. So I think that's growth that we've had. Um, and even us being here together, I think tonight is a part of us trying to illustrate that it is a, a collaborative effort um, to support that work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you for that explanation because your responses um, seemed very appropriate and made sense based on what Hopkins said, but I wasn't clear how we as a system would know if now it's do. March or yeah. April, you know, who's who's gonna know that Absolutely. we've done any of this stuff? And mm -hmm. and you would say it's incorporated in her the stat action plan mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. stat person has that will be reviewed by the principal and other people, mm -hmm. I would think. And to connect all the dots, Schoology now as our, our as our professional development platform um, our stat teachers as a group, they have a whole communication channel and group inside of Schoology mm -hmm. where they're having conversations, where they're sharing learning, where they're asking each other questions and collaborating. Okay. And if I could ask just one more. The first um, response item you talked about, how the stat teacher fits in the organ, a little bit, that went over my head a little bit. C could you go back to, I mean, you mentioned that in some schools they, Elementary schools, it's a principal or vice, mm -hmm. and the stat teacher, and then the high schools is different. But how did that? How does that connect to what Hopkins was telling? I, I, I just need a little help. So, um, in yeah. the Hopkins evaluation, per, in particular, uh, what what came out is there is some interest for our largest schools in that evaluation for an additional stat teacher, okay. more than one, for okay. example. Um, and so, what? I was trying to explain, sorry I didn't do a great job, no, is, um, is that uh, the stat teacher at our largest schools is one piece of a very large puzzle. Okay. And um, it's about finding the right fit for that stat teacher in that puzzle of most likely very highly effective department chairs, um, experienced educators, um, large buildings, lots of cogs moving. Right. And so <clears throat> how does that stat teacher who his pool is 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 experiencing professional learning everything every single month through these stat professional developments that we have. Um, work with department chairs who are also getting professional development. Right. And how does that all work together? The other thing that's really important is all of our stat teachers are non-evaluative, so they sit in a place where they can provide coaching and support, mm -hmm. and those who are working with them should feel comfortable that um, that they're a peer in that process. And so it's just about the fit in each building and how that works. Okay. And who, again, is overseeing that issue and gonna see if it's changing or getting better or it's gonna be just the same the next time they evaluate? I mean, that's what I just like mm -hmm. to understand. So I think part of that, um, we work in really close, CNI works really closely with the school support team, so the executive directors and the community superintendents who spend a lot of time in school buildings, mm -hmm. coaching principals. And so part of what um, the accountability comes from, how are we suggesting they use the model differently? So the, the conversation that we were having is, um, there are some positions in the system that are allocated one per school. A, a really clear example is the principal, right? And no matter whether you're Perry Hall High School or Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School, you have one principal. Principal. The role of the principal is going to look differently depending on the size and scope, and so is the number of people on their team. And so that's part of what Mr. Riali was talking about. Now, because the role, so if we were asking one stat teacher to be solely responsible for the professional learning of every teacher in Perry Hall High School, that would be unreasonable, which is why we've been pushing on it needs to be a team-based approach. So part of that accountability is if it's not working and the teachers in that building are feeling like there's only one person and we have X number of teachers, then that's when we would work with our school support team colleagues and say, here's another model for how that can be distributed leadership with the department chairs or with special education 
educators um, so that we're providing that as a resource or a suggestion for how they can work with the staffing that they have in a different way because if they're trying to do it the exact same way that is going to feel overwhelming in some of our larger schools and we're differentiating to, to one of the points up there we're differentiating we're doing a better job of differentiating our professional development for our stat teachers understanding that that is a big difference whether you're at Perry Hall High School as an example or Carroll Manor Elementary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Helena so I guess my question is now based on the recommendations and then the action plan the whole goal is to now make the whole idea of integrated technology move away from it being implemented and being brought to the schools and students getting familiar with it as well as teachers to now normalizing it and help making sure that we're focusing on now the educational aspect like a college student okay mm -hmm. they're familiar with laptops they know it's a lifestyle so now the whole idea is focusing on especially with the blended learning academics on moving from okay implementing it to this is what you do with it just just keep pushing just keep pushing schoology you can access your work online do it hand it in submit the assignment and especially yes you put it beautifully but mm -hmm. um i love the word normalize but also um <laughs> leveraging it so what are things that we can do now that we couldn't do without this tool mm -hmm. so this this idea of shifting has opened up a different way of approaching our students in the 21st century. So um, we want to make sure that if all we were doing was just substituting a piece of paper, nor are we replacing. We still teach kids to handwrite, and we, you know I love myself some books, right? I'm not getting rid of books. But how can, what's the difference so that this just becomes a part of the way we do business, that this is how we teach and learn um, because of the global economy we're preparing our students to be a part of when they graduate. And it's about not spending time in silos from our standpoint. So again, it's about Megan and I being here together. It's about academics and teaching and learning working together, school support, the same concept. So we're all on the same page. And it's not, it's not about, OK, what are we going to learn today about technology? It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. Thank you both. So our next agenda item, uh, Ms. Shea will be remaining uh, with us, and she <laughs> will be sharing with us today some curriculum updates um, with us in terms of um, courses that we would like to be bringing into our offerings in BCPS, as well as some updates on other curriculum that um, we're working through. Yes, yeah, so um, this should seem like a cycle now because I've been here multiple times sharing, oh, here's what we're planning to write this summer. And then I came back at the end of the summer and said, here's what we wrote and here's what we're working on. So this is just a part of that loop. Um, and so part of what we're going to start off with is um, talking about we have an opportunity to, this is not clicking at all. Um, so the, my goal here is to update you on what are new co course offerings that are in phase one. You want me to try again? Okay, so um, we want to um, talk Thanks. about what are some new course offerings that are being proposed by the content offices. So we call that phase one. And some of this you will hear reflective of things that we um, identified in summer curriculum workshop and what we were drafting. So you should see things starting to actually come true, which is very exciting. Um, and then also to review <coughs> some recommendations for either changes. So sometimes we have a need to change the name of a course or the level. Um, and then there is some need sometimes to terminate courses. And we'll talk about what the specific specific instances of that are. Um, you should also have as part of your packet the full list of all the courses, um, because the PowerPoint makes it kind of small and hard to read. Um, but I wanted to be able to walk through. Jeremy, it is not clicking again. <laughs> OK, so. Is it just user error? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to just keep talking and walk through some of the new courses. Um, so the first batch that I'm going to talk about is in um, CTE. Um, so we have um, two um, courses that are coming um, new as part of our PTEC program. Um, so you've heard a lot about the PTEC program offering um, that we have in our partnership at Dundalk and our partnership with CCBC. Um, so these courses are um, for the students in the Pathways in Technology Early College High School at Dundalk. Um, and they will count as dual credit courses um, options with um, CCBC. 
We also have um, two new offerings. The first one you'll see in there is um, an intro to apprenticeships. Um, this is a part of MSDE's Maryland Apprenticeship Program, where students would be able to take a one credit class and then have those 450 hours of apprenticeship. Um, our goal would be to pilot this in um, two schools next year, Milford Mill being one, and I'm gonna double check the other one in a second. Um, and so the, the other course that you see there in CTE is um, it's Patapsco. I knew there was one on the east side. So Milford Mill and Patapsco would be piloting the apprenticeship course. Um, the second course, this one is actually, um, it's on here now, but it is pending the results of a CTE innovation grant. We applied for a CTE innovation grant, um, which we should hear about very soon. Um, and the idea is to begin a program um, in aviation technology. Um, and what that really means is our students would learn to pilot drones. How cool is that? Um, and so um, pending the outcome of that CTE innovation grant, this course would be that first required course for students that would be accepted. Um, the grant was written to propose that we would pilot it at um, Franklin High School, Kenwood High School, and Randallstown High School. Um, so hopefully we'll have an answer on that soon. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I certainly will get it from Mr. Handy. Um, <laughs> The next level of new courses um, reflect, sometimes we um, create new courses to be able to extend pathway offerings for students. So for example, we've had creative writing courses for a number of years and we did not have an advanced academics level um, for creative writing. And we know that we have students that this is a passion and a talent and so we wanna be able to provide that opportunity. Um, in the same way, um, we are adding a middle school theater elective. Um, as part of our um, expanding, you know we're known for our fine arts in BCPS, um, but we wanna be able to to offer this in middle schools so that students can begin to spark their interest, which may dictate their pathway in high school um, and provide them that opportunity. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead for one second, which is um, the jazz ensemble is the same thing. We did not have a GT level of jazz ensemble, so this is just allowing our students who have that as a passion and a talent to be able to expand. Um, the ESOL, that would be offered in all schools. Mm -hmm. Um, based on staffing, it would be available to all schools. So based on enrollment and course interest when students register. Um, the high school ESOL 5, um, this is because um, we have students um, who um, research tells us that it may take anywhere from five to seven years for students to achieve proficiency. Um, uh, learning English, and we sometimes have students who are new to us that come in that might be on a level four, so they have not yet reached proficiency to um, be ready to exit the ESOL program, but they need an additional course. So this is just providing them that time and opportunity um, to learn that. Um, for music and dance, um, we have two courses there that you'll see um, that really are part of the sequence that follows um, a course called Music and Audio Technology. Um, so this is, again, really moving music into the digital age. Um, so um, last time, uh, I guess two meetings ago, we had that music um, where we shared some of the student compositions um, using the digital tools. So this is a part of that sequence. Um, it would be offered um, at Comprehensive High School. So it's not a magnet offering. This would actually be available to students across. Um, Dance of Athletes, this one is really exciting. So um, I know we, we smile, but it's actually been pretty popular in the pilot. So th this um, would allow um, students to earn a fine arts credit um, while learning about the science of movement and how flexibility and agility is really critical for our, our student athletes. Um, and to be able to do that um, through a dance class and also earn your fine arts credit is, is a win for our student population. Next, we have at the bottom there, you'll see one of our new courses is around um, the Next Generation Science Standards. That's what NGSS stands for. This course would be called Contemporary Problems. Um, this would be a high school elective course, which would allow our students to use, um, part of NGSS model is that you teach core disciplines of science, but you use cross-cutting concepts of engineering um, and also um, just design thinking so that they can understand how um, we solve problems. And so the the design of this course would be for students to explore um, what are some contemporary problems we're facing through science. So it might be an environmental science. Um, one that we were looking at was around this idea of the CFL light bulbs and what are some of the pros and cons in, in terms of energy um, consumption. And so um, students would have an opportunity to exhort, um, explore NGSS content while through an inquiry-based model um, solving problems. 
And then we have several courses in social studies. Um, you'll probably remember from multiple presentations we've done around social studies some of the changes, but these courses are really about shifting the middle school model to be more chronological. Um, so instead of just being geographic, we're now in a world history model that actually begins in grade six um, from prehistory through the fall of Rome, and then grade seven would pick up and move um, through the Renaissance. Um, so we still have themes in terms of political and cultural um, themes, but they would be chronological. Um, and then the next three courses um, would be um, as part of our law and public policy magnet program. Um, so you'll see there, um, first there's a class in international law, so that would be the sophomore course that students would take as a part of the law and public policy magnet. Constitutional law, um, the recommendation would be that it would be offered as a co-enrollment with American government, so that students have that um, as part of that. And then the last one would be, um, of course, there is civil and criminal trials. This um, would be a part of of, um, a senior capstone project as part of that law and public policy magnet. Um, so these courses, um, Towson High, we know, has the law and public policy model. Those are in um, place there. And then Eastern Tech is beginning this um, course offering, too, so that eventually all three courses would be offered in both those uh, magnet programs. This next one, um, we have two world language um, classes um, here, actually three. The first one is American Sign Language. So this is new for us to be able to offer this as part of our world languages pathway. And um, we're excited about it because in particular, um, this provides a great pathway for English learners um, to be able to take a world language course. Um, but it also provides a great pathway for our students who um, are in reading intervention, sometimes learning a second language while still working to understand the foundations in English as um, a striving reader can be a challenge, so this would provide students the opportunity to learn another language, earn that world language credit, but to do one um, that would actually complement the skills that they have. Chinese 7 AP um, is letting us right size Chinese so that we have the same levels offered that we do in French and Spanish. Um, and this also um, would prepare students to sit for the AP exam and hopefully pass, which would also allow them to earn the Maryland Seal of Biliteracy. You've heard us talk a little bit about that as part of our gift with purchase. Um, that's another um, recognition that our students can earn when they complete high levels of a, um, another language. And then uh, along that same lines, the last course listed there is um, Spanish for Native Speakers. Um, this built on the culture and literacy skills for some of our students who are heritage or native speakers of Spanish. So it allows our students, especially many of our English learners, but many of them may not be, but if they're native or heritage um, Spanish speakers, they can continue that study and deepen that dual language proficiency by focusing more on cultural aspects and the literacy necessary to communicate and thrive in um, that other language. I don't want to break your train of thought, but Go for it. the Chinese 7, how isolated is our, are our offerings in terms of, mm -hmm. of Chinese? Um, so Chinese is currently offered at Catonsville, Delaney, Lock Raven, Patapsco, Perry Hall, and Woodlawn High School. Okay. Um, we do sometimes run into a challenge where you have one student that has been on that pathway, and so that becomes a challenge in terms of staffing. Um, the Office of World Languages um, works to explore options for um, using an e-learning method so that we can kind of virtually connect students. Right. Um, so that's really how we address sometimes when there is those isolated cases, because we don't want to cut off a pathway for students that have been working. Um, but this actually will allow us to right size the pathway in those schools that are offering Chinese. Right. Thank you. But it is an ongoing thing that we um, work on. Um, okay, so that's pretty much the extent of the new offerings, and we're not clicking anymore. <laughs> so um, the next slide really talks about, we do have some courses, um, phase three is, um, part of phase three is about name changes. Um, so you will see in the packet, um, CTE in particular, as part of the governor's P21 recommendation, um, the recommendation is that CTE courses be offered at that honors level, so that it's a part of the CTE completer pathway. Um, so we did um, reflect changes in courses um, in these two areas, the HVAC welding course and the child development courses, um, so that they would be offered at that honors level as part of that recommendation. In music and dance, um, the name change was made for two um, chorus classes, previously known as men's and women's courses. We removed the gender application and aligned it instead to the vocal parts. So men's and women's chorus became tenor bass chorus and treble chorus, um, so that it more directly reflects the content. And then we also had a music and dance um, course that was called Motif Description Lab Notation. 
Lab and Notation is a very specialized, specific program for notating choreography and dance. Um, it is so narrow and so specialized that sometimes it precludes teachers who may not have had that specialized training. So what the Music and Dance Office did was to revise that to remove that level of specialization and to broaden that there are multiple ways of notating choreography. Um, and that new name is going to be Language of Dance, um, so that it really reflects a much broader way to describe how we um, notate in dance. And then we do have sometimes an occasion to terminate courses. Um, this really, the first reason that we would terminate a course um, is when we've replaced it with a course that we rewrote to align to new standards. So the best example this evening is we um, have a new social studies in grade six and seven where we've shifted to align to standards and to be um, chronological. So therefore we're terminating the old grade six and seven world cultures because you wouldn't need both. So oftentimes that would be um, a reason for termination. And then the other reason that um, we may terminate a course would be if it is no longer aligned to a current program of study or to state or national standards. So in your packet that you received, one example of this is that MSDE no longer recognizes the pro-image nails um, pathway. So we used to have a program where students could actually have a pathway in CTE where they could become certified nail technicians. And that program is no longer recognized by MSDE, so we have terminated those courses. There is a little bit of nail instruction as part of cosmetology, um, so that is still there, but we have um, a need to terminate courses because they're no longer recognized by MSD. Mm -hmm. So that's basically it. Um, any questions that you have for me about any of our new courses? Hopefully it sounds familiar to things we've been talking about with curriculum. This is, I always like being able to close the loop. Um, we d we're not given that pack oh. oh, the whole packet, so okay. I guess it would be. A we'll make sure that you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. we there? will email that out. We There was just a logistics issue that we Great. recognized oh, once sorry, we got here. Sorry, I was here. talking so fast then. Mm -hmm. I thought you had it. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say um, thank you for the world languages, because I remember a student came up to me in BCSE, and she was asking, oh, why isn't sign language a world language in a sense? Because it is a language that's universal, and it's amazing to see, like, oh, can give her back an answer yes. <laughs> it is now a language under yes. world languages and that's again one of the great things about bcps and its fight for students also i had a question so um a student brought to my attention how they felt as if there was no um programs like cte in a sense but it's just for students that don't attend the art and magna programs for them to be able to get the skills because not everybody's college bound but they felt like they were still lacking in opportunities for them to gain skills that didn't relate to college um, so what I will tell you is that um, part of the CTE master plan is to have um, CTE courses are actually offered in all of our high schools. Um, they're just not offered necessarily in every cluster. So part of our five-year plan in CTE is to make sure that every high school, comprehensive, magnet or otherwise, has offerings along that line within CTE. For So they do currently each have a program. They just don't currently all have all the programs. So um, the student may not recognize um, because it's not necessarily, for example, an industry certification like an HVAC or cosmetology, um, but that's a part of the five-year plan that Mr. Handy and his team is really working to um, be sure that we have at least one program in each of the clusters um, geographically um, so that students will see that they don't have to choose between going to um, one high school or magnet to be able to have those same opportunities. So that is a part of our long-range plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there is actually, if you want to go back to the student on the um, website in the Office of CT, there's actually a map that shows on the chart of where all those programs are. It's also part of the course registration guide. Um, so you can point that back to a resource for the student to be able to see what is actually available where um, so that they can see that plan. Sure. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. I think okay, we're good. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. So our next um, agenda item is really uh, to share with you um, about our um, board. I am Board Certified Behavior Analyst. So it should be BCBAs, as you may be familiar with us speaking to. So we go ahead and do introductions. I actually have one 
presentation, um, which has, it starts with the board certified behavior analysts. I have Rebecca Ryder, the director of special education with me, Kelly Evans, who is one of our BCBAs. Um, and then Marin Townsend is here because then we're going to go into a presentation about related services. So it's all kind of one package. Um, one reason we wanted to educate the board and the public about um, these services is because of different contracts that have come up over time and then perhaps budget requests and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. BCBAs. <laughs> I know. Okay. <laughs> so board certified behavior analyst, a board certified behavior analyst is a person, it's someone who is um, who has this level of certification in what we call applied behavioral analysis, and sometimes you'll hear the acronym a lot, ABA. That's really what it is, is applied behavioral analysis. Behavior analysts, they can work in schools, they can work in classrooms, they can work in clinics, hospitals, private practice, and nonprofits. And um, many of our BCBAs, they actually specialize in certain or specific areas, such as autism, developmental delays, and um, mental health issues. So what is oh. a BCBA? Mm -hmm. Oops, is... Oh, I'm almost uh -oh. done. Okay, you're gonna do it for us? Oh, sure. <laughs> So again, BCB has had that certification in the applied behavioral analysis, and ABA, basically, it's utilizing the scientific and systematic processes to help influence one's behavior so they're, they're, um, that they're engaging in more pro-social behaviors and we're decreasing their problematic behaviors. Behavior and analysis is just the study of how people learn and how people behave in various social settings. Um, BCBAs here within BCBS um, also collaborate with staff to develop learning um, plans for our students, individualized plans, and then they enact therapy for our students who are exhibiting more challenging or problematic behaviors. BCBAs, they can um, go into the classrooms and can conduct observations of students over a period of time, and then they work with school-based staff to develop behavior intervention plans. Again, they can work in many uh, different varieties of settings, but overall, they work with the individual on changing that individual's behavior. That's the primary goal of a BCBA. Um, in this capacity, they actively develop activities. They develop methods of evaluation to ensure that a student is making progress with the behavior plan. And then they also work with the school-based staff to develop intervention strategies. So there's two ways in which you can become a BCBA. Um, it is a graduate level distinction, and there's two pathways of which you could take. The one of which is you could receive or obtain a master's degree in applied behavioral analysis, education, or psychology. You also have to earn credits in applied behavioral analysis. There's 1,500 hours of supervised um, experiences, and they have to also pass the BCBA exam. So that would be one pathway or trajectory. The other one is to receive a doctoral degree in ABA, education or psychology, to have 10 years post-doctoral experience, and then to also pass the BCBA exam. So it's a pretty expen um, extensive educational background that you have to have, and we are very fortunate to have this level of expertise now here within BCPS. Mm -hmm. So what is ABA, um, the acronym that we're always using? ABA um, is the therapy that's based on the science of learning and on the science of behavior. It helps us to understand overall how does behavior work, knowing that behavior serves as a communication, it serves as a function for somebody. Um, it helps us to look at how does behavior work, how is behavior affected or impacted by environmental factors that are around you, and how does learning take place? Um, it, it basically applies our understanding of how behavior works in social situations. And there's a few principles of, of ABA. Number one is that behavior is a product and it's happening within, um, it's a product of the environment. It's also strengthened or weakened by what happens immediately following the demonstration of behavior. So a lot of times our BCBAs look very closely to see what's happening right before the child or student may engage in a problematic or maladaptive behavior, and then what happens right after that occurs to kind of determine how that behavior may have been reinforced and what we can do to kind of um, build in the um, skills that are necessary to change those behaviors based upon what's happening afterwards. And sometimes you'll hear the words antecedent, which means what's happening before, and then the behavior, and then the consequence. And the consequence in this terms is really what happens after the behavior occurs. 
Um, it's also looking to a principle is looking at a be behavior and how a child responds um, to those positive consequences that are given because that is what's known to have a longer lasting effect and more long term. And then also looking to see does that behavior increase after a consequence or after interaction or reaction occurs, do we see a more in, um, frequency of that behavior or do we see that behavior decreasing depending on what happens after, after it occurs? There's 30 years of research um, overall. It's okay. It's, um, it's demonstrated the, um, the efficacy and um, the, the positive um, outcomes that we've seen through applied behavioral analysis and really weakening or um, lowering those problematic behaviors and increasing those behaviors that you want to see that are more socially appropriate behaviors for a child. Okay. The functions of behavior. So one of our first goals when we come in <coughs> to see a student is to determine the function of their behavior. We don't keep doing behaviors that don't serve a purpose for us or help us out in some kind of way. So that's our first step in doing that. And the reason we do that is because it helps us determine effective interventions for the student. And then we can work with staff on how they can implement those effectively to help the student increase their skills in certain areas and also decrease those more problematic behaviors that we can see. Um, so one of the common um, examples, I guess, of the function of behavior, because all behavior has a function or serves a purpose. So if you're in the grocery store and child asks for candy and mom says, no, we're not getting candy, child has a tantrum, mom gives the candy, tantrum stops, right? The function of the behavior is to get the candy, which we would call a tangible function, right? And also for the parent, the function of that behavior is escape, because now people aren't looking at you anymore. Right, so it becomes a cyclical process, and that's in the same way that we intervene in the classroom. We determine the function, and then we can choose the right intervention to help the student. So we are very fortunate here um, in BCPS to have six full-time um, employees on our staff. We were looking um, to a lot of our um, students who we weren't able to serve, and we looked at some of our non-public sites and some of the private practices. So prior to about three years ago, many of our students would have to access this level of service outside of BCPS, or their parent would have to access this um, service privately. So we are very fortunate to have the approval through the budget process to now have a total of six FTE on staff with BCPS, and we also do work with consulting BCBAs as well. Um, our BCBAs have been instrumental in really helping us to work with our school-based staff. So they're central office employees that go out and work with all the schools within BCPS to help the school-based teams, that team approach in shaping those pro-social behaviors for students. Um, they support IEP development. Um, that's one way in which we utilize the support of the BCBAs and BCPS is for IEP development which is requested through IEP teams, providing indirect services to students, and then also with the facilitation of professional learning for our teachers and support staff. So for IEP service, um, much of like what Kelly shared is an IEP team could make a request to have the support of a board certified behavior analyst, and then in consultation with our office and the BCBA would go to the school. One of them, the tasks of which they would engage in first would be data collection, going into the classroom, conducting the observation, collecting the data, and working with the school-based staff to understand what does that data really mean? Um, are we seeing those certain behaviors occurring at certain times of day? Are we seeing it when there's certain work that's presented to the child? Are we seeing in certain days of the week? Is it after arrival, before dismissal? So they're really teaching the teams how to look at all those different data pieces and analyze those data pieces to find patterns or trends, and what are we seeing um, on the child doing after he or she engages in that inappropriate or maladaptive behavior. Then the BCBAs work very closely with um, the school-based teams. It could be a student support team or an IEP team. They work very closely with those teams to develop what's called a functional behavior assessment or an FBA. And that's really um, an assessment that's that is um, approved through the team process where they're looking at those behaviors and they're identifying, like Kelly shared, what are those functions? What is the child trying to gain out of engaging um, in this maladaptive behavior? And then they work with the teams to design what we call a BIP. The BIP is an acronym for a behavior intervention plan. So that's an individualized specific behavior plan for a student that is working on specific goals 
And then within those goals, how are we going to teach the child? This is where the instruction comes in. How are we going to teach the necessary skills that the child is lacking or not demonstrating? So that way we can replace those behaviors for more appropriate and pro-social behaviors. Um, the behavior intervention plan is developed with the entire team, and they all take responsibility in implementing the behavior intervention plan throughout the day, whether it's on the school bus when they're coming in in the morning, to the homeroom, to the special area classroom, the behavior intervention plan is implemented by all teachers um, that the child will encounter. And then they also, the BCBA really looks at how can we ensure that the child is accessing instruction. And then they'll go in and provide very student-specific training to the teachers that are working with the student. Um, and that training has included the teeth classroom teacher, the paraeducator, a special area teacher, whomever would be involved in working with with a child. And then we, I think we have a specific example to give. Uh, when I first started, which was about two years ago, I became involved in a case with a pre-kindergarten student who had been eloping within the classroom, within the building, um, and there were some concerns regarding the transition to kindergarten. It would be in a whole different building, a bigger building. Um, so I was able to work with the pre-K staff <coughs> in figuring out the functions of those behaviors and determining what would be good reinforcements for the student and the skills that we needed to build for him, such as asking for a break or asking to take a walk. Right? Um, we were able to support him through his kindergarten transition. We were able to decrease elopement to zero, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to start working on the skills of participating in class and working on his social skills with his peers. I'm really happy to say that he's in first grade this year, he continues to be in the general education setting, and he is doing wonderfully. <laughs> <laughs> so last school year, we had three BCBAs that were FTE. Um, this year, we're really lucky to have had three more added, which has been fantastic, because we can support so many more students in schools this way. Um, last school year, we were able to support 128 students in 66 schools. Um, we were able to be both proactive in helping to build capacity in the staff and providing some training and support, coaching and modeling within the classroom. Um, and then also with requests for support if there were some challenging behaviors that the school was wanting some help for. And as I said, one of the big pieces of what we do is professional learning and development for staff. Um, we had 361 teachers and paraeducators so far go through cohorts, which are the principles of applied behavior analysis. This is a blended learning kind of system. So we have face-to-face -face lecture with a BCBA, and then we also have online learning modules that are completed by the staff. And in addition to that, we provide on-site coaching for those participants. So we actually go into the classrooms, we do a little observation, and then we provide some feedback and coaching and modeling as needed for the students. Um, and this year, we're also introducing the behavior code to the IEP chairpersons through the training as well as to the special educator that they bring with them, which is helping a broader audience understand the functions of behaviors and choosing effective interventions. Um, our audience mostly has been that of the special education teacher and paraeducation teacher, or paraeducator, but we also um, did offer some after school courses this past school year to general education teachers, of which was very well received. So we're always looking at ways in which we can expand the professional learning of the ABA training to our general education teachers as well. Okay, so are there questions about BCBAs before we move on? I think you probably answered part of this um, early on in your presentation, um, yeah. which is the how are BCBAs <coughs> engaged, and I think you said it, it mainly comes from um, requests by the local <coughs> school kind of reaching out. Um, so knowing every child may have a good day or bad day, I mean, how how do you really determine how long that you're there, you, I know you said there are um, observations, drop-ins, things like that. I mean, it, you know, if you come on a day that a, a child is having a good day and behaving, I mean, do you say, okay, I, I don't see a problem? Do you say, okay, we're gonna spend the week here, pop in throughout? I mean, because I know there are children who may have um, 
behavioral issues and may, you know, even through their IEP, it may say that this child will bring like lighters to school or things, you know, things that a, another child may get into serious trouble for, but. I think that um, it really depends because it's a very individualized process. Um, we do get most of the requests come to us from the schools themselves. Um, there are some times, though, I think, where um, the BCBs have been to schools and they've actually recognized other, uh, other areas in which they could work more proactively. Um, I know Kelly shared one case where she's been kind of working on for two years and working with a school-based team. There have been some times where um, a BCB has gone in and it's only taken several times. Um, there's so many factors involved, some of which is the um, capacity and the background of the school-based staff and teams that they're working with and just the receptiveness to having an outsider kind of come in and give that, give that feedback. Um, so I think it really, it really truly depends. It can be anywhere from several visits to almost a year or two. Um, dependent upon the needs of the child, the complexities that are involved with the individual student, and then um, how quickly we can see some progress for, for the child. We also really rely on data as well. So if we already have the data that the student is having some difficult days and we go and we see that they are doing wonderfully, we'll come back again because the data tells us that we need mm -hmm. to. And that's usually sometimes what we'll hear is when I think you go to the school, mm -hmm. they'll say, oh, no, but this is not what, you know, what it looks like all the time. So then that way it's really knowing that even when they go in for that one observation, um, just as it, as it is if you're an administrator going to evaluate, that's like one snapshot in time. And you really have to kind of look at the whole story. And just as you are with grading, looking at that whole body of evidence um, when we're really developing those plans for our students. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, um, Lima. So is there, uh, the ratio for six um, BC BAs. BCBAs, is that compared to the amount of students that might need them? Is it one of those like, oh, a student, it's a issue where a student needs to be paired to one, or it's one of, it's a, okay, six is enough to carry the, capa the capacity of students that might need it. So I do think, I, I think as Dr. Woods alluded to earlier, we still would be um, seeking to have more of this level of expertise and support within our system. This is always something of which we're going to advocate for as part of our overall special education strategic staffing plan because we do recognize um, that we are so grateful for the six that we have, but it is not enough to address um, the complex needs that we have overall, overall as a system. We do have other um, tiers of support within BCBS. We do look sometimes as the BCBA is more of kind of that tier three, that intensive um, level support that we have. We do work within the Division of Safety and Climate with the MTSS resource teachers and staff. We also have specialists and resource teachers within our office um, that we also send out to work with school-based teams and to ad address the needs of individual students. And we really look to the BCBAs to kind of provide that um, next kind of, or that higher level of, of expertise. Mm -hmm. And we also um, still have a contract, so we know that we'll need more service based on how many um, times we contract out for additional support, and then we would know, oh, well, if we received another BCBA on the operating budget, contracted services hopefully will go down, so we can manage it that way. But I, I just like to add, I think part of your question is like ratio, right? Is it, you know, and I think as, as they were able to share with you, the complexity of the behavior um, is so variable, right? Um, that it's not as simple as saying, well, one to every 10,000 students, you need a BCBA. It's, it's really, that's oversimplification of looking at it. Um, and so there's many ways that we're constantly reviewing the, the need. And I just want to say that, um, you know, when it deals with human behavior, it's really much more complex than just a formula. And I, I think it's important to point out also that um, the number of staff that they work with who interact with the child is also um, something you have to consider. So uh, it, it, because part of the change in behavior are the adults that interact with the child. So the more adults you have to work with that interact with this child, that can sometimes take longer mm -hmm. um, to, to modify their behavior <laughs> as well. <laughs> Right, if you think about an elementary student may interact primarily with one teacher a day, whereas a middle school student will have an array of seven teachers, and in mm -hmm. each one of those environments, 
um, yep. behavior adjustments need to be coached and taught to see an outcome. We did see that with one of our um, high schools. We did have a student who was demonstrating some um, very concerning behaviors overall, and um, he did have autism, and he was not really interacting within the classroom, and he was really wanted to do anything to not be in the classroom. And the BCBA worked very well with all of the different teachers that were involved, in addition to the school psychologists that supported the team and the mm -hmm. social worker, who were also kind of experts within the building. And then over a period of time, it's so amazing to see, he actually ended up going into the classrooms for larger periods of time, and then actually also started participating after school in the marching band. Mm -hmm. And his mother was thrilled to actually have him um, partake also in other um, extracurricular activities within the school setting just through this provision of um, expert support that we were able to provide. Oh, go ahead. I think I've sort of gained the answer from what Ms. Ryder said, but I will ask this. Um, the BCPA, BCBA, um, their role is more of an impartial observer to provide input to the um, school staff and they don't necessarily work to try to build a rapport with the student, correct? It depends. <laughs> uh, so sometimes there's, for example, I support some of our SEL programs and I make sure I get to each one of them every month. Those are students that I've built rapport with. So they know me, I know them, I can jump in and work with them successfully. If you know there's something else going on and the teacher needs a little extra support, it's hard to coach implementing strategies if you don't know the student. Mm -hmm. right? So we do build rapport, it's just the level of rapport might change a little bit. So our first visit, we may be a more in the background kind of observer. Um, but the more we're providing services to staff and building their capacity, the more we're also working with the student and building our rapport with them. Thank you. But you're correct that the ultimate goal is to build the capacity of the staff to interact directly with the child and fade out the BCBA. <laughs> okay, and any other questions? I'm, I'm no, we still need to talk about related services. Okay. I'm Sorry, good. I know we're, we're no. tight on time here, so we're... No, that, that's good. That's okay. Fine. okay. Thank you. It's not clicking. Would you go to the next? Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. <laughs> And we can go to the next one after that. So with related services, um, that is kind of a subset office within the Office of Special Education. And we're really looking at the um, provision of services for students with IEPs and some for 504s. And we're talking about speech and language therapy. We're talking about occupational therapy, physical therapy, orientation and mobility, which is kind of aligned to vis those who have vision impairments, audiology and deaf hard of hearing interpreters. There's also kind of two other areas that we collaborate with quite often who um, don't live within the Office of Special Education, but we do collaborate with very frequently, which would be the Office of Assistive Technology and the Office of Adaptive Physical Education. Okay, the next one, sorry, thank you. Um, so what happens is if a parent um, and or school-based staff suspects that there is a delay um, for a child, whether it's in their speech or their language skills or even with their gross motor skills, um, a referral is made to either a student support team or an individualized education program team, so an SST or an IEP team. And what happens is that team would um, discuss the potential um, suspected disability and then usually they would request some type of assessment that would be conducted by one of those service providers that we talked about and then if there um, if there is a disability then we can um, and it impacts the child's educational performance then we can look at the services that could be provided by one of those providers on, and goals and objectives on an IEP or sometimes again services that could be provided on a 504 plan. Um, we do provide services to um, st students from birth all the way up to 21 years of age. Um, we, we kind of go from those who also um, have been called not found, they're not starting school yet, and they go to one of our child find centers and they have assessments completed in one of those um, assessment centers that we have in the Baltimore County. And then when they become school age, then the assessments would occur at the school level or at each individual school. We also provide services too to students in private parochial schools who need to access um, speech and language services um, or occupational therapy services and we have those are called service plans so it'd be those receiving services on IEP a 504 plan or a service plan because they are participating in a private parochial setting within Baltimore County 
Okay. <clears throat> we thank you for the opportunity to share um, information about our small but mighty army <laughs> of specialists who uh, directly support curriculum, um, access to curriculum and full participation in academics um, and educational performance inside and outside the classroom. Um, the first group is the speech language pathologist. And what's really important is to emphasize that it's not just the speech teacher, it is speech and language, which is a broader um, spectrum of needs uh, that we help support in the school system. So m moving just even from speech sound production, being able to articulate or use an L or an S or a K or a G, to um, phonological patterns, which really um, are very important for literacy and making sure that students are using blends or the ends of words, which is very important. Understanding language, of course, is very important in the classroom and, and on the playground and in the gym in terms of following directions and, and comprehending um, what is read to them or spoken to them. Um, expressing themselves, of course, very important uh, to be able to express their needs and wants as, as simple as I need to sharpen my pencil or, or to be able to give a presentation in front of the class, um, which is very important. Social communication, and we work very collaboratively with lots of other disciplines on this as well. So that's anything from being able to greet and be able to say hi or good morning, mm -hmm. to um, goodbye, have a nice day, a uh, nice evening, um, or to uh, use your social thinking to actually think about what somebody else is thinking about and, and attending to their needs and have them think about you and what you're thinking about, just like you are right now. And, <laughs> and how you will help support more boots on the ground that we need for um, all these great services. So, um, and the other big area that we think a lot of for speech language therapy is stuttering. So that's, that's a common term people are usually familiar with, but kids who may block on sounds um, and have difficulties communicating fluently. So um, they might get stuck on certain sounds or, or maybe repeat words uh, and things like that. Hmm. In terms of by the numbers for speech language, we have 185.9 FTEs. That's an interesting number, <laughs> Here right? It is. Um, and we have over 13 contracted providers. So we still are in need of additional supports. Um, and they work inside and outside the classroom. So it's not just the traditional old school, you know, they go down the hallway with the speech teacher and work on a sound, but we provide much more supports um, inside the classroom. As an example of how many supports, we provide over 4,800 hours of service per week across the county for speech and language services which is, a, is the largest of all the disciplines. Mm -hmm. I'll segue into occupational therapists. Occupational therapists are known more for fine motor skills, handwriting, eye-hand coordination, um, body awareness. So that's where you are in space, so I'm not too close to Kelly, mm -hmm. or closer than she wants me to be. <laughs> um, eye-hand coordination equipment. It can be as simple as a pencil grip or it can be access to how to um, use a device for kids who can't use their hands to use a keyboard. So maybe they use a switch or they use something else to be able to scan letters and, um, and pick the letter that they need to spell. Uh, another area in particular with written language is for dysgraphia, which is part of dyslexia, mm. um, you know, difficulties with written language and getting your thoughts out on paper. Um, is also another area. In terms of by the numbers, we have 63.4 FTEs um, and eight contracted providers at this time um, who work for occupational therapy. Thank you. For physical therapy, um, they address the skills such as gross motor and you know running and walking and those life skills of just movement. They also address body awareness and balance and help to support students so that they can get into a standing position and they work on posturing with students. Um, they also uh, um, work a lot in helping students to be independent with self-care and by that we're working on um, toileting plans with some of our students in um, a variety of our school settings and then also just mobility and working how do you navigate throughout the classroom setting, how do you navigate throughout the hall Always throughout the school building while on the school bus as well. And um, we also support by purchasing equipment for our students such as wheelchairs and lifts. By the numbers, we have 25.2 um, PT physical therapists and 0.6 contractual. 
with the physical therapist too, um, and also such as our occupation, occupational therapist, they also work very closely with other offices within BCPS. One of the offices that we work with closely is the Office of Strategic Planning and Facilities. So whenever we're designing new buildings or we're looking at replacement schools or renovations, they're a part of those conversations in the design process to ensure that the facilities will be accessible and that we're looking at all those criteria when um, moving forward with requests for, for new buildings. They also work very closely with the Office of School Safety and talking about what do emergency plans look like for our students with disabilities and making sure um, at the school-based staff through the um, emergency team within each school and then also by the child's individualized education program team. How are we going to respond in an emergency situation for a child who is in a wheelchair? What does that look like in regards to a safety plan for each of our students? Orientation and mobility. Um, for that, we were looking at children or students who um, have visual impairments, students who are blind, um, students who need use of assistive devices, and we are looking at how to teach the students how to move within their community, and we're using various equipment such as canes um, for students and teaching them how to get around within their environment. We do have 7.0 vision um, teachers who support, and it can go from those students who have um, visual impairments to students who are who are um, accessing their curriculum through Braille. Okay, uh, audiologists. So audiologists work to assess and help support students with hearing needs. Uh, really important area, especially for early identification. It's something that's done in the hospitals, newborn screenings. We support kids from birth through 21, again, with any kinds of hearing needs. Um, that can include hearing aids, uh, what we call FM systems, the ability to help amplify um, sound, the teacher's voice in the classroom. And, um, and there's a lot of training that goes uh, along with it in terms of use and care of hearing aids and other things um, with students in the classroom. We have four full-time. We have four buildings that have um, soundproof booths that, um, st that children access for those services in terms of the assessment piece. And in, in hand in hand with that too, um, for deaf and hard of hearing are interpreters. And this is an area too that is across the county and gen ed and special ed. So we have staff as well as children and students who are hearing impaired um, who require interpreting services by a sign language interpreter. So um, we provide those services 24 seven, just about it feels like, uh, because we get requests all the time, whether it's a um, parent conference and someone needs that assistance. Um, we get the large um, number of requests in the spring for graduation, high school graduation, um, any of the after school activities and plays and things like that um, for interpreters. And it, it's a very unique area too, because there's also, um, some standards in terms of how long someone can interpret. So, you know, the max is about two hours because mm -hmm. then you start losing that, um, the, the crispness, if you will, mm -hmm. of the interpreting. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, um, we work on that on a daily basis and make sure that um, students can access their curriculum. And that also includes closed captioning too and things like that. Celebrations, we always have a lot to celebrate in the area of related services. Um, and what is key is truly parent participation as well as general ed, special ed, and an entire team. So even though it sounds kind of trite that n there is no I in team is so true with related services. So even though we presented each discipline separately, I, I was thinking of um, even when uh, you were speaking about silos that we are, we are not silo driven. Mm -hmm. We are truly interprofessional and collaborative in our practice to help students access curriculum and participate in their education. Mm -hmm. Um, community of Competence is an initiative we're very proud of here within Baltimore County Public Schools and the Office of Special Education. And we work, just like Maren said, with multiple offices on this initiative. We work very closely with the Office of Assistive Technology. And through this, 
um, initiative, basically we want to ensure that every single student has a viable means of communication. We've partnered with a renowned expert in the field. Her name is Donna, uh, Dr. Janet Lair, and she comes and she provides face-to-face -face professional learning for our special education teachers and the support staff. And then she's also provided for some administrators as well. Then she and um, also our staff go to the buildings and support through coaching to make sure that the students have the communication devices that are a good match for them. I remember being here, um, I think a, a month, a few months ago, with uh, Mr. Embriali and Cam Dwyer from Assistive Technology and they were showing you an augmentative mm -hmm. communication device. Mm -hmm. Those are one of the devices that we actually use through this initiative. Um, and those are what we call high-tech devices that our students can use to access so that they can communicate their wants and their needs. We also have something that's called low-tech devices, which is really looks like almost like a piece of paper, if you will, with mm -hmm. just pictures on it, where a child can learn to point to words to communicate. If you go into a school such as um, Battle Monument School, you might see lots of different visuals that look the same. And the principal, he actually wears the core words on his badge right around his okay. neck. So that way, we can ensure that we um, are teaching those core words to our students. And they have a way in which to communicate, even if they can't verbally do so. So that's an initiative we're very proud of. Something else we're um, working on, too, is um, thinking about how we can maximize independence for our students. And this is an initiative we started about two years um, within the Office of Special Education, and it was really facilitated through our occupational therapists and our physical therapists at our separate public day schools, which are main choice, Ridge Ruxton and Battle Monument. And for that, it was really thinking about ways in which we can ensure um, our students were being as independent as, that, as they possibly can be. And we were really working on what we called an, a, toy, a toileting initiative. We had many of our students who, um, weren't able to go out into public with their families and they had to kind of go at certain times and we're talking about some students who are much older as well. So through the purchasing of lots of different equipment um, for the laboratory and bathroom areas so the students can really access the toilets um, and then also through um, a coordinated support plan with the staff. Um, if you ever go to, to one of those schools it's amazing to kind of watch how all the support staff chip in to ensure that the students um, are being independent as well, and we actually have had a family member share with us. She wasn't able to go out in public certain, during certain times in the evening because she had to stay at home and was confined to the bathroom within her house. And through this initiative, she was actually able to go out in the evening um, with her with her young man at that time, and they could um, go participate in regular public activities. Um, and so she was thrilled to have this, and we're really thrilled that the staff within those schools and the administrators have embraced this initiative, and we've seen a lot of progress with this. Mm -hmm. And um, the other celebration that we have is really, again, about using evidence-based best practices and um, pushing more into the classrooms where you're able to model and help support the student just in time. It's a lot of just in time learning both for the staff as well as the student, which is key. Um, so we do a lot of co-teaching in classrooms um, as well as small group and other instruction um, in that area. So that is, that is another huge celebration. Um, and the last is just even to share story. Um, one is, um, and we've had several that are very similar about, you know, a three-year-old child who communicates with unwanted or unexpected behaviors such as banging their head, screaming, running away, or running towards something um, to communicate. And based on a comprehensive collaborative evaluation process where you have multiple disciplines such as the speech language pathologist, the special educator, a general educator, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, looking at the child and providing um, and looking through multiple lenses and sharing that information, then they were able to develop a communication system and shifted from those unwanted behaviors to the wanted behaviors with effective communication using sign language to start, then using picture symbols to then putting together words. Um, and, and that's key too. Early intervention is definitely key. Okay, so any questions for related services? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say before you all leave, uh, thank you for the presentation, but also wanted to compliment you on the work you do every day with uh, the students. Um, as board members in Baltimore County and I think across the state and across the country, the thing that I think we're hearing most co consistently and constantly ab about the climate and behavior in the classroom, it's, it's just universal. 
and the expertise that you bring to address and improve these situations is is so important and it's important for it like our stakeholders in the community hear that but uh, you're you're dealing with it every day and we just hear it through you know communications but uh, we want to compliment you and then the related services addressing the needs of our most needy students and those that are that, that we really want to help the most you know from an equity standpoint and everything else um, it's very uplifting to hear some of the things that are going on so I just wanted to to thank you all for for the work in addition to the presentation thank so. you thank you, thank you. Right. I really appreciate that all right okay so, thank you thank you Yep. I think that concludes our curriculum committee. Our next curriculum committee is in January, uh, once the new board has an opportunity to come on board and establish um, committees. So okay. thank you. Thank you. And thank you for All your right. service on the committee. All right, thanks.